See, when you're in your 30s like me, you, you'll occasionally you'll question whether or not you even enjoy video games anymore. Am I still capable of actually enjoying games the same way I used to, you know, 10, 15 years ago? Can I justify the act of gaming as a 30-year-old man? Well, most of the time, probably not. I mean, and I don't spend as much time, you know, playing new games as, as I used to. I used to play a lot of the AAA releases that came out every year. All the major tentpole releases, you know, up until I'd say maybe the late 2000s, I was going out of my way to play stuff that was reviewed as exceptional. There was a time where you could read a Greg Kasavin review at GameSpot, and you'd come out knowing whether or not you wanted to play the game. You know, if he gives something a 9 out of 10, a 10 out of 10, there must be something worth checking out, right? So. That was a different time for games journalism. It was a different period of the industry and there were just more games coming out that were genuinely worthwhile. You'd get like at least three, four, five absolutely groundbreaking, just quality AAA games a year. It was actually hard to keep up with all of that Ludo, you know, so many masterpieces being released in all different types of genres on all different types of platforms. You know, it was truly an awesome time to be a gamer during the 90s and the 2000s. Now, for the most part, I, I simply don't partake because the direction the industry's gone, the, the constant game of quid pro quo going on with the journalists, it's just this feedback loop of dog shit, which I've long ago given up hope of any improvement. It, it kind of just doubles down. It's like this game of doubling down. And, you know, Gamergate was going to be the turning point if there ever was a turning point for the industry. And it just didn't happen. Nothing but acceleration, doubling down, coalescing, and cascading into the, the absolute Hieronymus Bosch nightmare industry of the modern. I, I'm, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic. I, I think just watching the situation going on with Blizzard, these male developers, they're sexually harassing the women at, at Blizzard, and it's bad, blah, 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 blah. I don't care if these are legitimate cases or not. <laughs> that, that's where I'm at. I don't give a shit. But I am enjoying watching Blizzard kind of implode because they totally deserve to implode. I mean, this company has just been the definition of cucked for quite a while. And watching them treat their own legacy like they're embarrassed and they're, they're changing it. It's like George Lucas, but instead of the lovingly autistic changes that he makes to his properties, love him or hate him, it's like a commissar of the Soviet Union erasing history that doesn't quite jive with the current status quo. And just to change and censor your own creation because of political correctness and to think that that's actually a good thing is just absolute madness, right? It's, it's anti-art. It's grotesque. And it just shows you how impotent the men at Blizzard or any of these, these beta males in these corporate spaces now. The only reason that they've been able to retain their jobs is through capitulation. And, you know, anyone who's an old school fan of WoW, I am not one of those people. But if you are, I can imagine you are probably just completely disgusted with what's going on. But ultimately, the, the HR woke blue haired milieu going on within Blizzard as a company for the past however many years has created the fertile ground for dozens of sexual harassment claims because these politicized workplaces undermine the very concept of sexual harassment in a legal sense. You know, the idea of even just men being men in the workplace has become pathologized. It's all so frivolous and it's all, it all just becomes a feeding frenzy of social media and virtue signaling and posturing for victimhood. It's, it's literally, it's just men in a workplace making edgy jokes. Nope, nope, we can't just tell these HR Karens within Blizzard, can you just chill the fuck out here and be reasonable? Nope, because of course, Blizzard is under woke Sharia. This type of, you know, feminist screeching implosion, it's just symptomatic of any space that gets infiltrated by wokeism, this woke zeitgeist happening right now. The end result is ultimately just a complete cave-in. Every institution in our society is, is, is in a state of implosion, thanks to blue-haired Karen in HR, gender fluid, pronouns they, them, freaking out about microaggressions. 
And really, there's an absence of rational masculinity in, in these spaces, in these companies, these institutions. There's nothing there, really, that understands how to make a good game. How to make a game that appeals to men, you know? How to make a good single-player game that appeals to men. That's a lost art, right? And it's lost because they just don't value us as consumers, as customers. They just, they, they don't want us. It's either a movie game with no soul, or it's a grind fest trying to suck the money out of my wallet while I get addicted to my own brain's dopamine, you know? There's that whole genre of modern games, but all of it is, you know, mixed in with a heavy dose of political pause. And it's really just not for me, obviously. And I understand that there, are, there is a certain type of game that, you know, I will instantly just be engaged with, and I will still get that joy of gaming, you know, that I think a lot of people miss that, right? You know, where multiple games per year would be released, they'd be AAA, and they'd all be super engaging, and they'd have something in common. And I'm going to say that that is, they were single player, in a time where multiplayer was focused purely on the couch co-op vibe. There wasn't this massive push on an industry scale for multiplayer. In the 90s especially, gaming was this solitary experience. It was a meditative masculine pastime, and the games of that era reflect this. That is the shit that I really like, and I think a lot of you guys have, maybe have similar taste in video. And speaking of which, I just finished the remake of Myst, and, you know, Myst, right? It's the quintessential Windows killer app. Classic point-click adventure. 1993. The remake, it's made in Unreal Engine, it looks incredible. You know, the visuals just make it even more of this experience, this lonely, weird, kind of atmospheric journey through this weird vaporwave island. It's just fucking great. And I never beat Mist as a kid, right? Because the, the puzzles were too hard. So this time, you know, being able to solve every puzzle and fully appreciate the genuinely cool plot and the lore is really cool and Riven, the sequel, I I'm just going to go straight in and just play the original Riven, which I never played. But yeah, like fully would recommend the, the Mist remake for anyone that is not too familiar with the puzzles. Although, there's an alternative mode where you can actually change the puzzles up, so it offers a fresh experience even for someone that's played Mist. And just being able to revisit such a seminal game, right? I mean, I, I owned it on the Sega Saturn, in fact, but again, you know, I found it too obtuse back then, right? Whereas now, as an adult, I really do appreciate what Rand and Robin uh, Miller achieved, right, with that game. It's just fucking great. Like, for me, yes, you know, it's essential Sigma Core. That is the kind of stuff that I really am into. And, and by Sigma Core, I mean single player. I mean, the, the kind of stuff that appeals to a certain type of man, right? Because there are games that are all about the social aspect. And especially now, modern gaming is very, very focused on the multiplayer experience. Even like a game like Final Fantasy XII, even that was kind of like, as an early example, pursuing this multiplayer aesthetic, even as a single player game, an offline game. It's taking ideas from online games, you know, because the whole industry has been just taking more and more ideas from the online gaming sphere. To the point where now it's all about loot boxes and loot boxes even make their way into single player games now. Everything is social, everything's connected to your social media. And as a modern man, right, there are certain things that I just don't get from life. Like, you know, kind of just being alone with your thoughts, that feeling of solitude, the kind of meditative experience of being a man kind of out in the wilderness, hunting or whatever, you know. The element of survival, the element of overcoming the odds, of overcoming chaos, right? Like feeling pleasantly isolated. I like games that have an element of that, you know, it's like that archetypal male red meat, you know, that is what makes a good game in my opinion, it has to have some element of that. So when I look at a series like the Soul series, right, Soulsborne and Sekiro, that for me is is just perfection, right, that's, that, that's chef's kiss, the perfect game for me, and I don't know, I think it's the combination of the, the JRPG autism with the stats, which I've always loved, I'm big, big into JRPGs, right? Love that kind of stat management. I also really like the customization angle. That satisfaction of fine-tuning, you know, a build, stuff like that, you know, fashion souls. 
this level of customization is something that, you know, I, I enjoy just from software and their games. And the fact that you know, even the Armored Core series also includes this high level of customization and the Spurg level stat management. So, you know, for me, I love that. I'd prefer that to be included than not. The problem is that you can't just rely on that kind of action RPG gameplay to make a Souls game that's really good, right? Because we've seen so many quote unquote Souls likes over the last few years, and a lot of them are very low quality because they don't complete the package in the way that the Soulsborne series does, right? Because it has the world building, the atmosphere of, you know, a really cool fantasy JRPG, right? With that Japanese level attention to detail. And instead of having like a ham-fisted single player story kind of foisted upon you, it really does trust you as the player to just be above room temperature IQ. Yes, you can, you know, you can put two and two together. You can read a lot of the environment. You can read in a lot of the narrative yourself. It respects you. It's a game that respects you as the player and it doesn't treat you like a fucking moron. Because I mean, you know, that, I think that's becoming rare. And really Japan, their industry is the only thing satisfying the old school gamer within me that, you know, I want to challenge and I don't want to be pandered to. And really that is what Souls is all about. No difficulty select. It's like a medieval doomer simulator. That resonates with, I think, a lot of men in the society. We're, we're doomers, we're a generation of doomers, and we play Dark Souls when we, when we want to chill and when we want to reflect and introspect. Because that is the thing. It's like the themes of the Souls series and everything Miyazaki does, it has like a universal appeal. It's not politicized in the way that the Western industry is. That's really why everything that FromSoft does that this guy is a part of or even tangential to is going to be good, right? Because these are actual game developers. <laughs> it's like we barely recognize them. In fact, Elden Ring's gameplay footage just dropped and people are complaining that it looks bad, the graphics aren't good enough, the animations are reused. I couldn't give two fucks about that, right? The fact is, this is a new original title created by fucking Miyazaki, the greatest working game developer in the world right now. And, um, you know, luckily for me, he caters to my taste in games. To the point where I, I think the first playthrough of Dark Souls, after I got done with that, I was like, wow, this is definitely one of the best games I've ever played. Could be one of my favorite games of all time. Every single game this guy touches is gold. And I don't think Ellen Ring is going to be any different. If anything, the reusing of assets just means it's going to be bigger. And bigger when it comes to a, a Souls game is always better. More items, more opportunity to role play. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. You know it. They know it. Everyone knows it's going to be fucking great. And it's going to justify again the act of gaming for me, right? Like I, I need a justification. I need there to be something good on the horizon, right? So I, I can count on FromSoft. I can count on Miyazaki for stuff that scratches that itch, um, you know, as a Chad Sigma gamer, which um, I think our tastes are being neglected and they have been for a while to the detriment of the entire industry. And that's, that's just the truth. But other, other games that I define as Sigma Core, well, definitely Metal Gear. We know Metal Gear. Just sending Snake in, he's this like, he is the definition of the Sigma, right? He goes in, solo mission, while he philosophizes about, you know, war and, and you know, the ethics of nuclear weapons. And, um, you know, that's really cool and weird. Uh, and then, you know, you have stuff like Stalker, which I've been getting into recently. I've been dipping my toe. I played about 30 hours of Shadow of Chernobyl. And um, that is a hardcore Russian game that it absolutely is, it's doing things, you know? It's having interesting effect on me. It's quite harrowing to play. It's, it's possibly the most Sigma game ever made because it is just brutal. The atmosphere itself is punishing. The Russianness of the systems and the menus is unsettling. You know, the, the lore of the world and the game is like borderline Lovecraftian at times, which is really cool. And I didn't realize that it had such cool lore. So even though the story is minimal, which is fine with me, you know, I don't mind a setting with minimal story. As long as the setting has some depth to it, Stalker absolutely 100% has this. 
And yeah, really enjoying it. Probably will work my way through the entire Stalker trilogy. I'll give the sequel a shot. I'll give it a shot. But I, you know, hey, cool game. And, you know, but we're talking Sigma Core. So, debatably, I mean, I'd say that Sonic the Hedgehog is like the ultimate gaming Sigma male. Because, you know, he truly is like an archetype that every millennial kid just, re it resonates with them. He goes his own way. You know, he runs fast. He's blue. He's cool. He likes chili dogs. Only in America, though. You know, in Japan, he's very stoic. He's, you know, he's heroic. And he doesn't even have time for, you know, femme hedgehogs, right? Femme hogs. Amy Rose is chasing him around. Like, she's, she's totally into Sonic, right? Because he is the Sigma Chad. But Sonic doesn't have time for Amy Rose. He's, he's got real concerns, you know? The rise of Robotnik. The subjugation of the, the, the animals of Mobius, right? He's going to liberate them. Almost single-handedly. Obviously, you know, he's got his bro Tails by his side. Tails has got his back. But hey, you know, it's all about Sonic versus authoritarianism. That's that's what it's all about. Because the US Sonic, the, the one that I grew up with, he had like this 90s attitude. That was the 90s libertarian Sonic. But in retrospect, I, I prefer the purer Japanese Natsok version of Sonic the Hedgehog.